Thanks very much. This is very quick. Um, just before I start, Alan Gore reminded me that 10 years ago, DRAI and engineers and so on, professional bodies agreed, the Laird Convention for Canada. So in a sense, you could argue that Ben is simply to talk about today, Laird Convention for a slightly more complex. But 10 years ago, it was great to the discussion, concern, argument, and it just became part of day-to-day -day work. So maybe in time, it will become part of day-to-day -day work. Paul has a background in multidisciplinary design, he worked for Rev the Rev Corporation, and then suddenly for Autodesk before setting out as an independent BIM consultant. He's advised on this important one man bands to the largest practices in terms of BIM adaptation and the implications of aspects such as workflow, teamwork, legal aspect, and very importantly, uh, fee structure. I'm sure people will sit on that particular topic. He's chairman of the AC UK BIM uh, protocols, which is now in the second release as a freely distributed model for best practice in quality assurance. It's gained worldwide acceptance and is in many countries and in several translations. Paul is now a full-time author, editor, and publisher of training courses on BIM. He's turned his hand to educating the market on the benefits of fully collaborative BIM ethos. In his spare time when reading this CV, it's hard to believe he has spare time. He's a magazine columnist who has a popular trainer and speaker around the world. So, of course, I'd take the stage. Equally, there are architects and engineers that are jumping up and down and saying, yes, we're BIM, we can do BIM. And a lot of those parties on both sides of that fence don't actually understand fully what BIM is. And when I mandate that you must use BIM on my project, I don't actually know what I'm going to get from that. I don't know what you're going to deliver to me, in what format. I don't know what I'm going to do with it afterwards. Um, so there is an awful lot of education required across the entire market 
before we can really see the, the wood from the trees in some respects. Um, and defining a standard is not about getting a group of, of architects in a room and sitting down and deciding how you're all going to use a particular bit of software. It is an understanding that incorporates the professional bodies. It incorporates the architects, the engineers, the QSs. It's going to incorporate the lawyers and the insurance underwriters and a lot of other people besides that have a vested interest in seeing BIM used correctly and uh, in a standardized format. And that's really what's got to come into the fray when we talk about standards. So these are some of the questions when I sat down to sort of look at this particular topic. These are some of the questions that sort of popped into my mind. Because it's, it's and some of them might sort of surprise you in, uh, in, in where I'm coming from with some of this. But if we look at, uh, at some of these questions one by one, hopefully we can, we can um, come to some answers. And, and I'm not necessarily going to give you those answers today. What I'm trying to do is to, um, is to, to get a debate going, to get things moving, to get things started with respect to um, you guys forming your own standards. Because if you don't have ownership of this, then that's going to fail from the outset. So first of all, what is it? Is it a standard? Is it a protocol? Is it a user guide? Does it matter what we call it? Well, it does. And I'll explain uh, along the way some of the problems we've had with, with some of the standards committees and, and standards boards that I've been on. Um, just on purely on this subtle terminology. But what I mean by this is that um, a lot of, uh, you know, if you, if you sort of sit down and you get a group of, of, of experts, BIM users, some super users, and you sit them down around a table and you say, right, we're going to write a standard. We're going um, to, we're going to show people uh, this is how you should use the software. To, this is how you should develop the material in order to, to transmit it and use it. What you will find from 50% of those super users is that they get down into the nitty gritty of press this button and then do this and then do that and it will result in this, which is the best way to do it. So you very, very quickly slip into user guide mode and uh, as if you're training your users exactly which buttons to press to get the desired result. Now that's not a standard. At the other end, at the other extreme, um, the standard becomes more of a legal document. It becomes something that is um, almost unreadable to the average user. Something that dictates your layering conventions, but in such language that it's, it's quite difficult to actually disseminate that information successfully through the teams. The protocol is, is, is one that I sort of personally favor because that's sort of a midway ground. It's, uh, it's layman terms. Um, it doesn't go into the nitty gritty of which buttons to press, but it's halfway house between the two. And uh, as I say, it might sound like a ridiculous sort of discussion starting point, but it is, um, it is one that is quite hard to stick to. And it's incredible how many times um, we've had to sort of bin really useful information, or not necessarily bin it, but push it to one side. You know, somebody's gone away and they've put a huge amount of effort into producing reams and reams of paper on a particular topic, and we've plucked out six sentences, which is all that's actually the standard um, part of that, and, uh, and had to sort of push it away from the crying man in the corner who uh, isn't going to see it published. Now, in putting a standard together, in putting a, a protocol together, um, there's certain things that we need to do. And there's certain hoops that we've got to jump through in order to see the successful adoption of any standard. And part of this is politics. Part of this is getting some sense of ownership of this document. Everybody's got to have a hand in. Not necessarily because that produces a successful document, but if they don't have a hand in it, then they don't have a vested interest in seeing that it works. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of truth to that sort of um, approach. So we need to identify who. Who is involved? 
I've mentioned some of the parties already, the architects, the engineers, the, um, the QSs, the insurance, the legal people, um, the FM, um, there's, there's a whole sort of host of people that may or may not get involved in this process if we're to see it done successfully. We need to define the terminology, we need to define the scope of the document. What do we intend to achieve? Um, and in, in looking at this, what's out there? There is an awful lot of information already out there. We don't have to start from scratch in pulling um, the protocols together. Perhaps there's too much out there. Perhaps there's so much out there that it's difficult to actually see what's useful, what isn't, what's contradictory, what is so similar that, well, which one do we use? There is a huge amount out there. Um, and in some respects, you've just got to kind of read through all of that and see where the common ground is and pluck the various bits and pieces out. Um, having a good team of, of, of people that are going to dedicate time to this is, is going to be critical. And in assigning responsibility for certain sections of this document, uh, it's in, in, imperative that a deadline is set and that people are seen to deliver by a certain time. Um, it, often this comes down to a, a small group of people who actually get this sort of thing done. There may be an awful lot of people in the wider circle of reviewers, of, uh, of people that are, uh, are dotting I's and crossing T's, but the actual authoring process of writing this material will come down to a very small handful of people. So like I say, who do we have to bring in? Some of the more obvious aspects of, uh, of BIM um, are the, the users of BIM software. The, there are an awful lot of people out there that are using the likes of Revit and Archicad and, and, and Bentley software um, and by doing so imagine that they have ticked the BIM box. I've bought a copy of this software yes I can now say to this contractor that I am BIM ready. Now there is a huge difference between purchasing a piece of software and adopting um, a methodology. Um, it's funny, we were talking as, as that last night uh, for a meal uh, with Alan Hall and uh, we were discussing the, 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 the adoption of BIM or the, the introduction of BIM and I firmly believe that BIM is the biggest upheaval, the biggest change to our industry for the last hundred years. Now I don't mean that flippantly because you could, you know, a lot of people compare the introduction of BIM to the introduction of CAD. But if you think about it, CAD simply took the techniques of the drawing board and put them on a computer. It tried to incrementally improve the efficiency of the process of producing drawings. What BIM does is, yes it does all of that again, but what it also does is to fundamentally change how we do business, how we develop the team structure, how we uh, negotiate contracts, how we define our fee structure. All of these aspects are incorporated in the, the BIM overhaul of our, uh, of our practices. And as such, you know, it's a massive, massive thing. It's not to be taken lightly. It's why, um, unashamedly, at the moment, you can't move in our industry without sort of seeing those three letters writ large on every document, every headline, in every trade and uh, paper, is all about BIM. But it is that important that it, it has to be discussed and, 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 and troll through till we're absolutely sick to death of it because we need to fully embrace this and we need to get behind it. And I firmly believe that it's a case of do or die in this. The current market as it is and the emergence from our current financial situation is going to be about BIM. And um, the, 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 you guys have a, a very real opportunity to be um, if not at the at ahead of the game, then at least at the very forefront of it, because you are such a small market, you can react an awful lot quicker 
um, you know, that trying to get BIM rolled out in the UK is, is, is like trying to turn the ocean liner. Um, you guys can react quickly. You can get everybody around a table. You can get some standardized approach and push it forwards as an entire nation. Um, and, and in doing so, you can really sort of be at the forefront. And, and I, th I think that that's an important aspect because um, without it, I think the, the, uh, the efficiencies um, are going to be missed. So as well as users of the software and, uh, and the, the fringe benefits that come to the manufacturers and the fabricators and so on and so forth, it's important to discuss in this standardization the, the clients. Um, so the various government bodies, the various parties that represent huge amounts of buildings need to be in that discussion when we talk about um, when we talk about standards, what are we going to deliver? How are we going to deliver it? How are you going to use it once you take it forwards? We shouldn't forget that the vast majority of buildings already exist, and we can easily define BIM protocols for that greenfield site of putting up a new building. Um, but we've got to develop as an industry. The, the protocols and the, 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 the workflows surrounding the refurbishment of existing building stock. How can we improve the, uh, the energy efficiency across a swathe of a thousand buildings, not just producing this one unique little piece of architecture that, uh, that is on this nice little flat field. Um, and that also needs to come into this approach of, of, of standards. Um, the need for standards and protocols does not, is not led in the UK by the architects and engineers. Everyone's happy to take um, whatever's out there and use it internally. Everyone's happy to mix and match, change their existing CAD standards and actually get something that works. And that is the cheapest way forward. Bizarrely enough, if everybody just sort of spends a bit of time, they're comfortable with what they've got, it's something which is their own IP, and we're very protective of it, um, and we can tick a box to say that we have BIM standards in place. But the requirement for uh, an industry-led standard approach by everybody comes from the lawyers and the insurance teams. Now, I'm on various sort of um, steering groups and, and advisory boards in the UK, um, pushing a lot of the BIM standards forward. And we, um, obviously, the, 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 one of the teams I'm on is, is the, 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 the legal and risk um, team. And we had a representative from an insurance um, agent there who basically said that they were so concerned about the, the free-for-all in BIM, that they were looking to ring fence all BIM activity and say, right, okay, we will ensure the deliverables that come from the design process. We will, um, we will sort of underwrite your activities as a designer, but we will not underwrite your BIM productivity process because there is no standard, there is no defined way that I can say uh, that you know what you're talking about. I mean, bizarrely enough, here I am stood in front of you saying that I'm a BIM expert. Who said? Who is to, uh, who, you know, what can I point at and say I'm a BIM expert because I've done this? Now, obviously in my case, 13 years and, and, and lots and lots of, of, of evidence under my belt, but that doesn't necessarily mean to say that, that I'm right in what I'm doing. Um, there is no official body to say that I am a, a BIM practitioner and I know what I'm talking about. And I think that's something that you could start with in, in Ireland, is actually to define something, whether it's under the auspices of an existing body, whether it comes under CETA or it comes under the, the, the various professional bodies that already exist, or whether there is a new requirement for an association of BIM practitioners, 
But I think there's, there's definitely a requirement for something that actually says, yes, you know what you're talking about. That practice has somebody that has that badge. Therefore, when they come on our team, we will know how they will work. Now, that's got to be, it, there's a bit of a chicken and egg there. There's got to be a standard in place to check that against. Somebody's got to be able to audit that process and assess whether that person's competent or not. But at the same time, it's these people that are going to be the controllers of that standard. Um, just read through that. Um, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is something that we put together. I, put, I wrote this for one of the, uh, the UK government steering groups. Um, and this is a work in progress. But I wanted to, to sort of flash this up. Um, this is something that will be released and, and on various websites and things. But it's, it's, a, it's a process we've gone through in actually trying to educate the market. So this is aimed at the small to medium enterprises that are trying to understand, do I need to get in, involved in BIM? Um, and what we've basically done here was to, uh, to define certain um, suggested, um, suggested solutions to BIM, ranging from uh, you need to be aware of it and keep an eye on it through to you really need to pull out all the stops and get everybody trained and obviously steps in between. What we've then done is to identify through a series of questions um, how you interact with the building. Um, are you a, a, an architect engineer? Are you part of the supply chain? If you are, then do you do this? Do you do that? Is your manufacturing process able to use the digital data, etc., etc.? And the end result is you come back to one of these suggested solutions at the side here. And this is all about this education process. And it's a huge requirement that we actually educate the market um, in order to, to, uh, to understand who is involved. So. The wheel already exists, you might just have to change the tires. The last thing that the, 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 the worldwide BIM community needs is for another standard that everybody should now follow. Um, we've got an awful lot out there um, that, is, that can be pulled apart and pulled, put back together again in a form that suits your particular requirements. There is no need to start from a blank piece of paper. Some of them are more software specific than others, and I'm going to talk about a couple of those um, as, as a way just to explain certain, uh, certain things. Others are freely available and, uh, and, and are very generic. So two particular ones to look at are the AIA and the Penn State, which are currently available. The AEC UK, which is um, what I'm a member of, is, uh, is about to bring out release two, and I'm going to talk about that one in a short while. But there's, there is a lot out there to start reading. We also need to look at interoperability, because without interoperability, BIM is nothing. BIM becomes an internal process of creating better and and faster information. You throw interoperability into the mix and suddenly BIM is that game changer that we're all talking about. Because information is what BIM is about. BIM is not 3D modeling. BIM is the association of design intent with object data. And the ability to transfer that information from one platform to another is imperative. How do we do it? Well, we've all talked about IFC and Corby and, and the rest of it. Corby, by the way, is just a branch of IFC. It's all part of the same thing. Corby is what is being dictated by the UK government. And it's, it's quite a disappointingly low level communication standard. It's effectively a spreadsheet. You could conform with the Corby protocols with a pencil and a, and a, and a copy of Excel. You don't need fancy BIM software to actually meet these requirements. That said, um, th this fancy software does output directly to Kobe in a way that means that you don't really have to bother with it. But it's not, um, it it's really is a very, very low level um, transfer protocol. And it's certainly not a two way, two way approach. You couldn't sort of take information from Kobe and build a model from it. 
Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all about transferring information in a, in a way that is the, the common denominator for everyone. IFC uh, as a bigger picture is, it does have that potential um, and IFC is, brings up an awful lot of debate. I don't know if any of you, any of you go onto these LinkedIn uh, forums and, and various other forums that discuss BIM, but you can't ask any question without it ultimately coming down to Autodesk versus the world almost. Um, very vehemently people defending different bits of software and why won't Autodesk support IFC and these sorts of, of bold statements. It's not quite as simple as that um, and it's not a discussion I'm going to get into. Um, IFC is a standard of, of, of passing information between software applications. Where it falls down is the fact that it's not a tight enough standard. If you imagine having a, and this is a simplified summary of, of how IFC works, if you imagine you've got a list of 100 things, in order to conform with, you know, to be IFC compliant, you need to tick 20 of those boxes. Now, as you can imagine, if I've ticked 20 of those boxes, I am compliant. My software is compliant. But that's not to say that somebody over here has ticked the same 20 boxes. And we can actually pass like ships in the night because we're both IFC compliant, but we happen to have ticked a different 20 boxes. The worst example of this is actually Revit, where you can IFC export something uh, and it doesn't come back in again. <laughs> um, because the IFC import and the IFC export are two different standards, which is the most bizarre thing in the world. So it's not just about Autodesk's fault, it's about, um, the, the, you know, there's all sorts of, of, of bits and pieces in there that need to change in order for that to improve. IFC is the closest thing we've got to um, an interoperability language for BIM. And I, I strongly hope that it will actually um, meet our expectations ultimately. But there are others, there's GBXML for the environmental stuff, there's, uh, there's a whole host of others that are out there and, uh, and are emerging. Okay, so very quickly I'm going to run through uh, the AC UK efforts, just because it forms a bit of an example of how, um, how you should and shouldn't do stuff. Um, so the AC group was formed from a committee of like-minded individuals. We basically had um, people that were tasked within some fairly large organizations, medium to large organizations, they were tasked with developing standards in-house. And instead of working 100% of their own efforts, they got around a table, divided up the efforts, and wrote different sections each, and ultimately they created something that worked for all of them. So that's how we started. And, and, and bizarrely, um, as, as John said at the beginning, it started with CAD layering standards. That's where the AEC UK committee came from. So exactly the same origins as, as, as this group that we, uh, we, we, we represent here today. Um, now, what happened with, um, with sort of taking that forward was we said, okay, we're not about defining you know, new standards that are gonna compete with BSI. We're not here to, to sort of um, set ourselves up as a new organization that's gonna lead the world. We're simply here to try and provide an interpretation. How do we actually take those standards and make them work in the drawing office? Um, and that's really what it was all about. So where are the gaps? What do we need to do? Which standards can we pull in in order to make this work? Now, the, the bit that I'm chairman of is the Revit group of this, and what we did was we basically um, brought everybody together, we looked at the, the, the various bits and pieces that were out there, and we wanted to form um, a document that could act, so that if you were looking to adopt BIM, you wanted to push BIM forward within your practice, and you happen to have chosen Revit to do so, then this document was there for you. Now there is a, uh, there's versions of it for different bits of software as we'll come on to. But initially a generic BIM standard was developed um, where we had representation from Bentley, from, from, uh, from Revit users, from Archicad, from um, Vectorworks uh, and Tecla. We had a, a representation from the user base of all of those and we sat around and we, we wrote a, a generic document. This document was so generic that it was useless. 
because we had to sort of avoid certain terminology, we had to include certain terminology, we had to make sure that we stuck to certain defined terms that were out there and used. And the end result was something that was, you know, apart from the 10 people sat around the table that wrote it, nobody else was going to ever use it. And we knew that as soon as we'd finished it. It was, it was ridiculous. Um, so then what we did was the, uh, we had that, that document and we released it very proudly. We put it out there and we said, everybody look at this. And everyone sort of shrugged their shoulders a bit. What we then did, we sort of, we, the Revit team then said, right, that's fine, but that's not, that's not good for our users. That's not good for the Revit users. So we took that 20-page document and we turned it into an 80-page document. And we produced the AEC UK sta BIM standard for Revit. BIM first, Revit second. But it is a BIM standard for Revit users. And I, there's no apologies for that. We wrote that. And that was then taken by the Bentley crowd, by the Vectorworks crowd, uh, Archicad, uh, Tecla, and they basically looked at that and said, right, well, if we change this, this, and this, we can make it work for us. So we then had a, a, a collection of different documents, all very, very similar, but all aimed at that particular user base. Now, the Revit one in particular has been out there the longest, and that one has been adopted by a lot of different countries. It's been translated into various languages, um, and it's very, very successful around the world. Um, far more successful than, than we ever anticipated. Um, just because it was so thorough and it was so uh, readable, it's also one of the few that was actually sort of not ashamed to say that we are Revit and we're not trying to be generic, which I think was, was kind of part of, its, part of its success. Now, we're now looking at the, the second wave. So we've seen that success that we've done from that first wave. We're then looking at the second wave. And what we've done is we've taken that, uh, that Revit standard, we've taken all the feedback, all the comments in, and we've developed it into release two. What we've then done is we've passed that work around to um, the various other parties, the various other software um, users, and we've told them to pick out the bits that they cannot use. So take out everything that is irrelevant to you and leave us with what, is, what works. And what we're left with is a hub in the middle with a spoke for the Revit aspects. What we've then got is spokes for the other aspects. So the idea behind this this, this hub and spoke approach is that you would approach this and say, right, I need the center hub plus that particular spoke over there because that's what I'm using. Um, you, may, you, know, you may choose a different spoke, you may have to choose several spokes because you're using different bits of software. And obviously, the ring that's going to go around the outside of that is the interoperability of how these different software packages work together. So that's the approach we're now taking in developing this this set of protocols, and note the name change from standard to protocols in the process. Again, over heavy debate and political pressure, we've, uh, we've changed the name of it. So, there's all sorts of deliverables coming out of that. We've got checklists for transmitting information, we've got checklists for uh, BIM execution plans, we've got um, health check, we've got uh, templates for the different software applications, etc. Lots and lots of information we have to consider when we're thinking about what comes out uh, as the deliverables from this set of protocols. From a government perspective, we've also got to think in terms of what are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to do something that is for today or tomorrow? Are we trying to set um, some ideals? and some objectives that can be met in five or ten years' time? Or are we simply looking at one year hence and what can we do now? What's achievable in the next 12 months? And how should the standard be written? How should the, where do you look for that, um, that, that sort of um, goal, if you like? Should it be halfway house? For example, here we are with the, 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 the levels of BIM. Um, what are we aiming for initially? Are we trying to say that we should have, I mean, what the government in the UK have said is that they want to see level two BIM used on all public procured projects by 2016. Um, 
and that's down here. So it's not that we're trying to say that we're going to go the whole big level three picture. But what they're saying in the UK is that level two is achievable by 2016, by the masses. To be fair, there are people that can achieve level two right now. There are people that within 12 months will be able to achieve level three quite successfully across their design teams. But the masses are not going to get there by 2016. And it's an achievable target to say that people get to level two by 2016. Very, very quickly, BIM level one. Your silo approach, your lonely BIM. You may use CAD, you may use um, BIM software to do it, but effectively you are in a bubble. You don't transmit your information in a BIM format. You don't send the model out to anybody, but it's used for your internal purposes. Any transmittal of information is on paper, even if that's digital paper, PDFs or DWFs or whatever it happens to be. But ultimately, we are talking about using the software in isolation of our transmittal process. So whether you're using BIM or you're using CAD is somewhat irrelevant in this level of, of information. So it's not exactly a, a, you know, a, a huge step to get to this. What we sort of basically say is that level one BIM, no contractual change. Level two BIM, some slight amendments to the contracts and we can achieve level two. Level three, we need a whole new set of contracts for IPD. But level two by 2016 is not, um, uh, uh, you know, it's not a, a massive leap by any stretch. What level three BIM is about is where everybody's using BIM, all of that software is communicating successfully between the different team members, and you sit down regularly and you have your meetings around a virtual model. Um, and ultimately this is where, and this is where a lot of people are in the UK already in, in, respect, in many respects. They don't go the whole hog, they don't use it to, want to its full potential, but certainly aspects of this are creeping in. So some of those red arrows of paper trails are being replaced by the blue arrows of digital information passing across. Um, the full level three BIM of, of this all working and paperless office and all the rest of it, you know, I've been waiting 20 years for the paperless office to arrive and I think I'll probably wait another 20. But it's, um, this sort of thing is, is where we stand. As it happens, we have to ultimately go down to paper when it gets to this guy because as yet, we're not gonna give him an iPad and a chisel. Um, to work out what to hit. Um, so it's still going to come down to drawings at some point. Although we were discussing last night, um, uh, there's a guy, a bit of a crazy guy in America. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the 3D printers that are, um, that are emerging. And there's various forms of that. Uh, there's a guy in the States that's actually developed um, a, a 3D printer on a large scale and he prints houses. Um, and it basically just moves this big print head that sprays concrete and then it moves around and sprays another layer of concrete and eventually you end up with a house. Um, I can't quite see that being the future just yet, but we can see um, that it's, um, this is ultimately where things, you never know, where things might head. <coughs> but where is the standard end? Which part are we actually aiming for? Um, do we go for the ideal? Do we go for what's achievable today? And that's an important aspect. In defining the scope of the standard, uh, you must define what you're aiming for. Do we say that we are going to dictate workflow that says that you've got your model, you, that cuts down into views, the sheets are developed, and we issue those sheets? Or do we actually acknowledge the fact that temporarily we might have to actually export that out into CAD, into spreadsheets, in order to develop our information in a more conventional flow? If you've got an office of 20 people, two of which are trained on BIM and 18 are trained on CAD, then you need something in the interim that's actually going to allow that workflow to carry on unless all of your work is left on the heads of two people or the job is one or the other. So those, um, those processes need to be incorporated because in the short term, 2D and 3D need to stand side by side in the, in the average office and will do for quite some time to come. We look at, we can encourage workflow, we can encourage methodologies that push forward best practice. Um, and we, 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 we would, I would encourage you to do this quite a lot, is to actually 
sort of say, yes, the software can do lots of things, but let's look at how it should work. How do we, uh, how do we model our components? What level of development do we require? Um, and whether you're looking at having a survey done on site or you're looking at delivering a model to an end client, the scope of that, uh, that modeling information is imperative. And this is one of the most important parts of the standard. If I tell a surveyor to go out and, and measure a building that exists, do I expect him to show me every 22 mil pipe? Or am I expecting him to show me only 100 mil pipes? Or am I expecting only to get a rough idea of the building? Am I expecting to see every single little cornice and, and, and detail that's in that? A huge difference in, in, in where we stand, both in terms of fee and deliverable. Um, the same applies to when we produce our models. Do I expect to see the, the rounded edges and the shininess of every single tap within the building? Or do I simply need to see a symbol that represents the fact that there's a tap there? Um, and that's, uh, uh, as I say, that can make the difference between profit and loss on a job. Um, you know, have I oversold the, the, what, I, what I'm going to deliver to you? Have I under-delivered? Um, have I said to the client, yes, you can, of course you can get full rendered images out of any, anywhere in the building. You just drop a camera in and I can give you a fully rendered uh, photorealistic image. Well, you can if you put very complicated objects everywhere within your building. So it's going to take you four times longer, and you've just stripped out any chance of making a profit on that job. So set your expectations, both from a, a client's perspective and from the delivery aspect. And don't forget the metadata. The information is what's key to BIM. Without it, we are just 3D CAD. Uh, this is the, 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 the various um, levels of development, and I'm, I'm not expecting you to read through that, but basically, again, same thing. Um, what am I expecting? What am I going to get from this particular job? Uh, what level of detail? We also talk about, again, workflows, transmittal workflows in this case, defining best practice. Um, and again, from the point of view of where are we aiming this, we can define best practice, but then we also perhaps need to talk about what is not good practice. What do we, we recommend this, but let's also show this, because we need to show that, because otherwise you might assume that's correct. There may be sort of some people that say, okay, well, well that's how this works, and well, I imagine we can do something like this. And ultimately they've got something which is very bad practice. So we've got to discuss things that, you know, and explain why things are bad practice, as rather than just simply pointing at uh, the good practice. Um, now, one aspect of the industry that we're, we're, we're sort of told is, is something that we need to improve upon is this, represented by this McLean curve. Now, I'm sure you've, you've all seen this before, and this is all about the fact that our ability to impact costs falls off um, as our cost of any design changes uh, goes up. Um, so that we basically, um, the, the, the further through the design process we go, uh, the more costly it is to make changes and to make corrections. Um, and, and so where we currently sit in traditional design process is somewhere down here, where the majority of changes take place at, at this point um, when we, we're sort of a halfway house. The, uh, preference is to try and move everything back so that design um, changes are made when the cost is low and the ability is high. Great. All very understandable and very commendable. The problem there is that often this is speculative. This is a time when we're still trying to sort of tender for the work. We're still trying to win it. So the idea of me putting all of my effort in here when I'm not getting paid or I'm, I'm still trying to sort of compete. Um, and then by the time I get to here and I am actually now on the job and I'm getting paid and actually, oh, worst case, I didn't get the job but I've already put the work in. So, you know, there is a, there is a, a sort of a, an issue we have here. Um, in an ideal world, this graph makes a lot of sense. But at the same time, we've got to offset that with what are we going to do to actually make some money around here. Um, and we need to, to accept that fact. It's the sort of thing we're talking about. You know, do I need this in order to actually show 
um, my BIM data? Do I need to actually have every fan blade and every um, incremental object, sub-object, built in order to actually represent an object? And the answer is no, you don't. You can get away with an awful lot simpler objects, placeholders. We can see, um, you know, we can see a symbol that represents a chair, and that chair can represent any chair from any manufacturer at the early stages of the job, in the concept stages of the job. We can swap them out later. But we need to be clear on what I'm going to deliver now. At this stage of the project, I'm going to give you grade one objects, symbolic chairs. Further down the line, when you're paying me lots of money, then I can give you grade three chairs if that's what you require. But horses for courses. Why are we bothering? I've sort of covered this a little bit already. The, if we can form our standards, we can form our associations that recognize those standards and the ability for people to, uh, to use and um, adopt those standards within a project, then we can bid for work on an international arena with a good, solid background. We can do so with the backing of our lawyers and our insurance underwriters because we're working to a confirmed method that we know works. We can bring our costs down because of that. And we can work on a level playing field. There are lots and lots of reasons why we need a unified standard and not disparate individual standards that work for me. Team structures are going to be affected by BIM. There are new roles emerging. There are new objectives that we have to, to meet. And the process of this top-down approach, the traditional process of saying, right, I am the, the design lead on this, and I will pass information down the line, is somewhat blown apart by BIM. Because in BIM, everybody has a part to play. The person who is putting a model together is no longer a tracer that doesn't understand what it is they're doing. Or if they are, they'll soon learn. Because when you're putting BIM data together, you will have a better understanding of how that building works, how it is constructed. And therefore, you will be influencing design. So the flow is far more two-way. The structure is far less um, of a pyramid when we actually see BIM working effectively. I've been advising um, various professional bodies in the UK on certain aspects, and one of the most common aspects is the role of the BIM manager, coordinator, um, the person who is going to ultimately control the information that flows between the various parties on a project. But who should that person be? Should it be a QS? Should it be an architect? Should it be a project manager? Should, it be, should he work for the client, for the contractor, for the architect? Should he be independent of all of those and act as an arbitrator? Arbitrator. So where do they stand? Who are they? What are the job roles? What are the risks? What, are, what am I setting myself up for? I recently got asked to provide an audit of BIM on a particular project. The client, uh, based in the Middle East, had, a, had, had been asked by their client to, to provide three sta key stages during the, the job to produce a full and independent BIM audit. How would I go about this? So I wrote a little report and I said, well, I would do this, I would do this, I would look at your processes, I would check these against the standards, I would make sure that everything was in place. Uh, and they said, okay, that all looks great, how much? And I said, I don't want it. I can't touch this because I don't know what the implications are. I don't want to be the first one to put my head on the block and say, yes, I've audited this BIM, everything's fine. The building didn't work, it's your fault you audited the BIM. Well, yes, but what am I auditing? Am I auditing the design? Am I auditing the fact that the, the BIM wasn't put together in the right way? Am I auditing the fact that the, the design doesn't hold up as a, in a structural way? What, you know, what am I actually auditing? Um, and it, it was just too, too big uh, without the backing of any, uh, of any sort of you know, insurance company. And when I did speak to an insurance company about this, they just sort of politely declined 
as well. Because again, it's just there's no precedence. There's no sort of there wasn't a common standard that we could point at and say, yes, if you do everything that's on this list, you will be fine. Um, and it, that that is a key part. That is a, an absolutely imperative. We do need those people. I would like to be able to stand up and do that. Well, actually, I wouldn't. But um, somebody needs to. Um, and at the moment, it's it's a very difficult one. <laughs> One of the big things that, uh, that really got the insurance companies uh, in a bit of a fizzle was the idea of a single building model. A term that's been thrown around a lot. And the insurance companies read that exactly as it's written and expected the single building model to be all parties all working on one file, throwing information in, and the result is a fantastic building or a complete mess and everybody pointing the finger. I didn't do that. You did that. Look, there's the log that says you came in and you did that on that file on that day. It just doesn't happen. It's not something that actually uh, is, a, is, is here in the short term nor the long term. Everybody has their own models. All disciplines have their own version of the BIM and they bring those together in a collaborative sense to meet and to discuss. But you don't actually work on the same model all at the same time. Legal implications of, as we've said, of contract, of, of litigation, uh, risk of the terms of the uh, terms of the contract as far as deliverables are concerned. Um, what are you going to deliver? Who owns what you deliver? Does the BIM data, the, the, the 3D model that you have, at the end of that job, do you just give it to the client, to the contractor, have, uh, by virtue of the fact that they've paid you, do they therefore own the model? Or is that an, an extra? Is it something that, okay, I decided to use BIM myself, I could have used CAD. I didn't, I chose to use BIM. Does that mean, therefore, that I should give you this incredibly rich and powerful model because of the decision I made? Or is it something that I should keep for myself and give you what I was contractually obliged to give you, which was a set of drawings? <clears throat> there will be a huge amount of intelligence in that in that model and consequently um, you need to assess how much information goes in and where that information, um, where the ownership of that information lies.